Hey, yeah, Joe, they all stand up. <laughs> That's cute. All right. There we go. Everybody has a book. Sarah, you have a book? Yes. Page 106. It says in the margin, the third day of the month of Tavis, which we just left. We moved into Shirat. Sarah Milligan. Nice to see you back, Sarah. Nice to be back. Yeah. Good to be healthy. Yes. Great. It's like so many things in life. We only appreciate them when we don't have them. When we have them, we take them for granted. We should all enjoy our parents while we've got them. Okay. We've been learning about the relationship between the Yetzirah, the Yetzirah, and the Yetzirah. They are like opposites to one another, reflecting one another in, 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 in an inverted manner. The same way that there are 10 holy aspects to the godly soul, we find that there are 10 impure aspects to the animal soul. The animal soul has many different names. The animal soul, the uh, vital soul, the human soul, the Yetzirah, mm -hmm. the wise guy, all different names, the names for the for the same thing, which is the that that voice inside of you that tells you not to go forward in your Yiddish guy. Like we learned last week in the Parsha, we read in the Parsha that after the Jews crossed the Red Sea and they were very excited about their relationship with Hashem, they saw, they lived with Hashem every single second, just like Hashem was splitting the sea every second. If he, if he didn't split the sea every second, it would have caved in on them, which is what it did for the on the Egyptians. So here they were living with Hashem. They experienced it in their day, moment to moment life. And we have to take a great lesson from that to know that this is good. That's where we are now. We are now in the middle of, of the sea. The sea is split and we're walking through and we are in the presence of Hashem every single second. That's the lesson. And then, as, but as soon as they came out of the sea, what happened? We see two, two events. One, they came to Tova. They came to Elim. And what, were, what did they find in a place called Elim? They found... Um, well springs of water to, to drink and palm trees so they could sit under the palm tree in the shade and learn Torah. That was the, there were, there were a specific number of wells and trees to accommodate all the 12 tribes and all the people. So the, fir the first thing we have to learn after we get into our brains that we are living with Hashem every single second, just like we're crossing the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, is the next thing is, now let's learn Torah. Okay, so they did that. Then what happens? They run out, run out of water. They don't know what's going to be. And they start to complain about where, where are they going to get food? Where are they going to get meat? And once they start complaining, Hashem says, oh, you're complaining. <coughs> And right away, along comes Amal. Here comes Sarah Business. Right away comes Amalek and attacks them, the first of all the anti Semites. And so many infamous anti Semites throughout the ages, like Haman, Haman, and like what we recently saw in Germany during the Third Reich, are descendants of this terrible, terrible tribe of people who are, are just filled with bitter hatred uh, of our people. 
And you think, how is that possible? We just went through the Red Sea and, and right away, the, anyway, the, the, that's, that's it. So we have to always be constantly grateful to Hashem. And when things don't seem to be so perfect, not to complain, it's Hashem will take, Hashem will take care. But don't invite the, the Amalek in you to, to rear its ugly head. And what is the Amalek in you? Because everything in the Torah, everything we read about, as a spiritual counterpart in our own heart. What is Amalek in your own heart? Amalek is, is that voice inside of you that tells you, don't get excited. Cool it, you know, cool it. Good morning. Who is this? This is Leia, right? Yeah. So you come into the learning the Mahona Yadus, you go into the dorm or you don't go into the dorm, you meet wonderful friends, you're very excited about the learning, and then somebody expresses a word of criticism or skepticism about what you're doing, and right away, oh, you made, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I'm fooling myself, and that, that is the voice of Amalek. Cooling you off. As it says, well, we see that what did they actually do? The Amalekites, they came and attacked the Jewish people in the rear, in the rear, the stragglers, those who weren't really keeping up. And since they weren't keeping up, since they allowed themselves to be cool, to cool off, that's where Amalek came. Okay, this is where we're up to now. So <clears throat> we've learned that. When a person does mitzvahs, does a holy activity, does a favor for a friend, lights a Shabbos candle, helps a, fr a friend to learn something or to appreciate our Jewish experience, does a mitzvah, learns Torah, then the, the Shechina, that is to say, Hashem reveals himself dwells upon this person and surrounds this person with hope with his holiness but in order for that to happen it's it's required that we should also participate in that that we accept hashem upon ourselves that we want to be connected to hashem and we want to do holy things for the sake of doing the holy thing because that's the right thing to do for the sake of being connected to Hashem. But a person, why else would a person do something? I can give you a, a reason. Because he has an agenda. A person wants to get something and thinks that I'll get it by doing this. I want to get a job. I want to get uh, a position. I want to get a good shidduch. I want to get friends. So therefore, I'm going to go through the motions. I remember reading a story about a person from... You know, before the Second World War, who came from a very poor family and sat and learned in yeshiva with great uh, uh, application. What was the reason? It wasn't that he loved learning, it's that he knew how to learn, but he felt if I'm not going to learn, if I'm going to learn, I will, I will be taken out of here. I'll be put into a yeshiva where I'll have food, I'll have clothing, I'll have uh, a, room, a room and board, I'll be taken care of. If I'm not going to learn successfully, I'm going to go back to the poverty of my family. And he didn't want that. So he was learning to avoid the poverty. Okay. If we're learning for any kind of an agenda like that, then don't, we can't say that the holiness of Hashem really rests upon us. The, 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 the prerequisite for the holiness of Hashem to rest upon us is that we surrender ourselves to it. I'll give you an example. Like when a girl gets married. She has to give herself over to her husband so that he can be her husband. Because if she holds back, then he doesn't fully marry her. This is that a, a husband has to take a wife. How does he take a wife? He gives her a ring, which is money. He gives her a marriage document, which is a contract. He takes her into his house. That's how do you acquire something? 
How do you buy a car? You give money, he gives you the keys, you drive it home. Until you drive it home, he didn't buy it. How do you acquire a wife? You give the, you, you, you get a document, you give her money, you take her home. When you take her home, she becomes yours. But she has to allow you to take her. If she holds on to her mother or to her previous friends, then she's still holding back. She doesn't fully become a wife. This is, uh, I remember on my wedding day, this was explained to me by a Hasid who, who, who said that, that the, avoid, the husband has a, a, his own inner quiet avoid of Hashem under the chuppah, which he's, he's praying to Hashem. He's dedicating himself to the marriage that he's entering. The Kala, her avoid is to allow herself to be acquired to free herself of all previous connections and ties so that she can become completely connected to Hashem. This is called bitul. Okay, bitul to, it, says, it translates it here on page 106 as surrendering oneself. I give up anything else. I just want to be connected to my husband. I want, so in terms of Torah and mitzvahs, we want to be connected to Hashem. We do Torah and mitzvahs. In order to be connected to Hashem, in order to do what Hashem requires of us. Okay? What if, on the other hand, um, a person doesn't do that? A person has an agenda. So then that's what we call in the, in the popular expression of today, he has a big ego. If your ego gets in the way, you don't surrender yourself at all. You want to fit the whole, you want the whole of life to fit into where your your ego sees things and wants to see things. So that's what it says on page 106. Okay, if a person does not have this quality of bitl, which is surrendering oneself to the holiness of Hashem, then the holiness of Hashem does not rest upon him. And he does not receive his life from Panimius, Panimius Hakadusha from the inner aspect of, whole, of Hashem's holiness. Now, these words, mahusa, atzmusa, mean the essence of a thing. The, these are subtleties in the Hebrew language that we don't have in English. They basically mean the same thing. Mahus is the essence of the thing, and the atzmus is also the essence of the thing. Which is more essence than the other? I, it's hard for me to say. There, Often it talks about the existence of a thing as opposed to the inner life of the thing. So the inner life is the mahus, and the existence of it is more superficial, the external quality of it. But we, we can recognize the existence of it, but the mahus is something much deeper. So a person who does not surrender himself to godliness, <clears throat> he doesn't receive his, his life and vitality from the inner essence of godliness, which we call panimius. Now the word panimius, the root of that word is panim. What does the word panim mean? Those who speak Hebrew, what it means your face. When you care about somebody, you look at them. You allow them to look at you. If you're angry with somebody, you turn your face away. You don't want to look at them. You don't want them to look at you. You show them your back. That's called the backside. The Yetzirah is a backside character. The life that he gives you is from the backside of holiness. It's life. All life is from Hashem, but how do you get it? Panemius is like a father takes his child and lifts the child up and plays with them face to face. Panemius means face to face. From the word panim, which means face. So panemius means inward, essential, from the, a deeper level. Whereas, let's say, somebody does, you, somebody who well, you don't have a nice relationship with them, and they do something very good, like, the, the, let's say, this girl, you really don't really like her very much, and she's the star in the, in the school play. And you have to tell her she did, she did, a, she did a, a good job. 
So you say, yeah, that was a real good job, sorry. But you don't really mean it. It's called a backhand compliment. Backhand means not, not with love, not with love, but with resentment, okay? So life from that's coming, not from Hashem directly, is coming from the back. Like it's a, the a metaphor is used in Hasidus, like when you throw the dog a bone. The bone is from the steak that you had. You, 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 the steak was made for you to enjoy. The bone is leftovers. You give that to the dog. That's how we get life from the Yetzirah, from the backside. Page 107. So this is a very limited form of life. And, it, and, and, and we get it through clippers. Now we remember, clippers, today we're going to eat fruit. So we're going to throw away the peels. Clippers means the peels, the, out, the outer, it's a protective covering. The real fruit is inside. Life that comes not through Torah and mitzvahs is coming to us through the through clippers. And if a person does not surrender himself to the panemius of God, then the life that comes down through a chain of life, through clippers, level by level, each level less than the one before. That's what it says here, descending degree by decree, degree through myriads of levels in the chain-like descent of the worlds in the manner of cause and effect. Cause and effect means I'm thirsty, I drink, I'm not thirsty. I was thirsty, therefore I drank. It was a cause and there was an effect. Um, I paid for the object and I was able to buy it. It's a cause and effect. <coughs> I gave the person a nice compliment. I made him or her smile, cause and effect. But then there's another level by which life is transferred and that's not cause and effect. That's by a leap. That's called in, in, in a contraction. Some has, they, they talk about a quantum leap. I'm not sure what a quantum leap is. It means like totally other proportion, not something that's the next step. It's not the next step. It's, 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 a, it's a, a leap to a, a level that's completely incomparable. And that's called simtsum. And that is the key word. We can't translate it into English. There is no English word for it. Here's Hana. It's a tremendous, after it's symptom, the life is greatly diminished. Greatly, greatly diminished. So much so, you're not even sure what was, what was the previous step at all. It's, it's so far removed. Tzimtzumim rabim. So as the life comes down, it's, it's diminished and diminished. Sometimes you drive along the highway, like um, you're coming from Niagara Falls, and, and you see these wires along the side of the road with condensers on the wires. And these condensers are meant to step down the, the intensity of the energy, because if we have all that energy, that's coming from Niagara Falls with tremendous power from the water hurtling over the uh, escarpment and being passed through turbines, spin them around inside electric coils and generating electricity for the whole East Coast. You can't put that through a light bulb. It, it, it's too intense. So it has to be stepped down and stepped down and stepped down and stepped down. And he, the, the stepping down takes place in two ways. One is cause and effect. And the other is by leaps, which is called simtsumim. And simtsum really answers one of the basic questions in Jewish thought, which is if Hashem is infinite, infinite means no limit. How can I connect to him how can, how can this world exist? Because everything in this world is limited. It's a certain amount of life 
in everything, in every flower, every tree, every animal, every creation has a certain amount of life to it. It has an expiry date, a certain amount of strength that you have, not more. How can I, a limited person, a certain amount of intelligence I have, whereas Hashem's intelligence is unlimited. Everything about Hashem is unlimited. It's infinite. How can the infinite connect with the finite? Well, mathematically, it cannot. Right? If you have a mathematical equation, you put infinity into it, the <coughs> equation doesn't work anymore. So how is it possible for us, limited human beings, to connect with the infinite, with Hashem Yisbarach? And the answer to that question is Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is the process in Hashem's creation by which he contracts and limits his own life to the extent, level after level after level after level, until the light is so diminished that it can come into this thing that considers itself an ego, considers its, its, its own existence as paramount, thinks only of itself, therefore is very self-centered, selfish, uh, says the limit. All I can know is what I can perceive with my five senses, and that's all there is. There have been philosophers like that, right? Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I think, since I know that I'm thinking, therefore I know I exist. Mm -mm. Doesn't work like that. Hashem thinks about me, therefore I am. The Greek, whole Greek society, Greek sculpture, what do they show? The emperors or the, the ruler, they're all, they show their heads. Because for an egotistical person, that his, he, his mind, reason is the center of the world. For a Jew, we, we cover our heads to remember, always to remember something above us. The word for the head covering is yarmulke which is from the Aramaic, which means Yire Malka, fear of, of the one above, fear of the king, who is Hashem. So we always have to remember that which is above us. That's the source of humility. Humility, if a, a full vessel cannot take anything in it. If this cup is full of water, coffee, whatever, can't add anything to it. If we make ourselves full of ourselves, Hashem can't get in. Hashem says, I and he cannot dwell in the same place. Godliness needs a clean, empty vessel. We have to make ourselves into that clean, empty vessel. When I first came here, and I, I, would, I merited to have an interview with the Rebbe called Yechidus, so I said to my friends, friends that I had made, what do I do? How, what am I supposed to do? They said, well, you write a little note, you give it to the Rebbe with your name on it, your mother's name. I said, what do you say in the note? So they, they coached me. And you ask a blessing to be a vessel for Hashem. To be a vessel for Hashem. That you should be a clean vessel, an empty vessel, just to put yourself aside and let Hashem run the show. Okay, that's called bittel. So if we have bittel, then Hashem dwells with us, dwells upon us. If we don't have bittel, then he, describing, he describes here how the life is diminished level by level by level by level through cause and effect stages and simtsumim, intense contractions, diminution after diminution until it becomes so contracted that it can become a little insy bit of life can enter into this egotistical person in a manner of exile. And this is the secret of the exile of godliness. When our Yetzirah guides us, that is exile. Because then when we do something that's not appropriate, do something that's a negative commandment, either you do it knowingly or you do it by accident. But when you're doing it, Godliness cannot come into you 
in, a, in an open and revealed way. It has to come in in a very contracted way because you're doing something Hashem doesn't want. You're going against the system. <clears throat> so therefore, a little bit of life can come in, but not what you really need and not the full amount that you could that you have the capacity for it and that is the secret on, in a very personal way to what Golis is all about that the, you have a godly soul which your godly soul does not want to do a transgression and therefore never consents never will consent to this and what's a classic example of this uh, intermarriage When a young Jewish boy falls in love with a young non-Jewish girl, they're both lovely people. That's why he likes her. Uh, and they, they get married. They say, uh, all his friends and teachers and so on, may, family may even tell him why it's not gonna work. He says, yeah, but my love is very strong. Our, our love is very strong. We'll, we'll be able to make a go of it. But the truth of the matter is, it's like oil and, and wine. They never combine. Oil and wine cannot combine. And the Jewish soul and the non-Jewish soul cannot combine. So a person, so his animal soul, his Yetzirah, his animal soul loves her animal soul. But there's a godly soul in there. There's a godly soul in there that, that is screaming and protesting and, and will, can never consent this because it's not a union. Godly soul wants to be married. Like two drops of water, they touch, they become one. <clears throat> Page 108. So the life comes into this person, the ego, egotist giving him life he's called the Dover Nifrat something separated he has separated himself from godliness Hashem says keep the Sabbath and a, one, a person's friends say let's go to a concert let's go to a movie let's go to Manhattan and he goes the godly soul does not consent that's not what the godly soul wants But you're getting life. So how are you getting life? The life is coming through the clippers. Now it's not coming in a direct way. And we can't say that the holiness and the, of the essence of godliness is dwelling upon this person because he's going against the grain. It's like a person trying to walk on his hands. You could walk on your hands, but it's not going to really go. You can't go through life walking on your hands. Okay. So the life comes into a toich So this is called a, a, a person who separates himself from the source of his life is called a nifra. This in Hasidic terms is like the biggest insult to a person to say that he's a nifra. He has separated himself from the source of life. So this minimized, contracted drop of holiness comes into the person in a backhanded way, not a willing way, not from the face to face from godly, from the holiness of God, but in a backhanded way from the clippers. And the life comes into him in a manner of exile. It's, it's uh, the godly soul is in exile in him. Creating him at the very moment that it's giving him life. So that you get such a thing like Pharaoh, king of Egypt, decrying godliness, saying, I've never heard of this God that's higher than nature. I don't believe in that. His name is not in my book of gods. Even as he's saying it with energy that's coming from God. There was a philosopher in Germany in the 19th century who went around saying God is dead. Heaven forbid. But really, he was dead. 
because the energy that he had was coming from God. But was God giving him energy in a, in a loving way? No. That was coming in a backhanded way. And yet giving him life, second by second, like we said earlier today, like the crossing of the Red Sea, the life is coming into us every single second. And this is something to think about, that we are constantly, all of us, we are constantly crossing the Red Sea. We are in an environment that is being created as long as the Red Sea split, as long as the wind, the strong east wind was blowing, right? If it stopped blowing for a second, the sea would cr come crashing back. You know, it's like bingo. You ever go play bingo? They have these machines that blow air and the, the ping pong balls get blown up in the air. And each one has a number written on it and a letter and they fall down one by one. But as long as the air is blowing, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's up in the air. Well, the whole world is like that ping pong ball and the air blowing up is the godly force creating it out of nothing. And if it doesn't get, if, it, if it's not in the air shoot, the, the stream of air holding it up there, then it falls back down. So this whole world is being created out of nothing. Remember our first class, the whiteboard with nothing on it? So Hashem has to create a place where the world can be. That, and, and, and to do so, he has to hide himself. So if that hiding doesn't take place the whole time, then the world can't be can't exist. So therefore, the world Hashem has to constantly be creating the world out of nothing, so that it won't return to its original state of nothingness, which is not nothing but is Him. So it won't return to its source of life in Him. So here we have a person who is getting his life from Hashem as he's using that life to. To teach people that there is no God or that you shouldn't do mitzvahs. Now, on page 108, the bottom of the page, where it says the seventh day of Tavis. So that's why there has to be this whole process of hiding the light of godliness. So that there should be a place where Klippa can actually survive. Because if Klippa doesn't survive, if, then there's no challenge. Then we only see godliness. If we only see godliness, we have nothing to choose. To choose something, you have to have a couple of opposites. Each one of them has to seem attractive to you. So Hashem has to create the opposite of what he wants in order that we should ignore it. And we should choose to do that which is right and good and, and what he wants. We should do the mitzvah. So Hashem has to create all the temptations on Shabbos so that we don't do them. And then, and, and then we connect ourselves to Hashem by connecting ourselves to what he wants. So therefore, Klippa, you see, has a very important purpose in life, which is to present us with a challenge, because challenges enable us to bring out the deepest sources of our, of our uh, desire to be connected to Hashem. And this is something that shluchim experience over and over and over again when they're put, when they are challenged. And shluchim and everybody, when we're challenged, all the challenges in life, what is a challenge? A challenge is when God hides himself. When we don't see, when everything is going good, uh, yeah, everything is, is, is a blessing. We're so happy. You meet the right person and everything is going good and you're gonna have a happy life together Everything is blessing. What happens if things don't work out? Then we have challenges. The point of a challenge is that you should try, you know, Avis, what is it? Avis, rent a car. We try harder. 
Until now, you didn't have a challenge. So Hashem, when you have a challenge, you don't see godliness. You don't see Hashem. Ashliach told a story on, on Yud Shvat about how he was building a Chabad house and, and he couldn't get together the money to pay all the bills for the building, to pay the contractors and to, to cover the mortgage and the banks were foreclosing on him and he was going to lose it. And he had nowhere to turn. He tried everything. He had nowhere to turn. So he decided, that's it, I'm giving up. I'm giving up. He saw the end. He saw no way of overcoming the situation. He went to the Oihel and he said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, I'm finished. I can't. I have two weeks till the bank forecloses. I have to produce $600,000 by Thursday. I don't have it. And I've tried everything and I have nowhere to get it from. He didn't write a letter. He didn't say the mine illusion. He didn't say anything to heal him. He just stood and it was a freezing cold night like this in January. He was all alone. There was nobody there. There was one person he'd been trying to contact in Israel. He never met him before. He'd heard that he had helped. I was a philanthropist. He'd helped out many people. He contacted him. They exchanged emails and the guy stopped writing back. So that was it. So he gave up. He says like, Spiritually, I'm giving you back the keys, Rebbe. I'm done. After 20 minutes in the audio, he went out to the side. He's going to go over to the Rebbe Sinchama just to speak to him. He just spoke to the Rebbe. He didn't write it. And he, he looks over to the uh, place of Rebbe Sinchama, and there's somebody standing there in the middle of the night. What's somebody else doing there? There was nobody else at the audio. And he looks at the guy, and he thinks... He recognizes him. He never met him in person before. That's the guy he was trying to contact. He starts screaming his name. The guy says, what are you screaming for? You're going to wake up everybody here. And he says, like, what are you doing here? He says, I just got off the plane. I came from Shea. And they speak, and he says, and he says you know, I'll tell you, I, I helped a lot of people. He was, I guess, a very, very wealthy person. He says, I helped a lot of people. But I decided enough is enough. I'm, I'm out of, I'm, I'm not. You're telling me your situation. Okay. I mean, and he gave him all the money to, to, to bail him out. That kind of a challenge brings out the deepest things in you. And, and, and when you're in a situation and all of a sudden there's no more blessing in it, it just seems to be the opposite of blessing. It doesn't mean that the, the situation is bad. It just means Hashem has hidden himself from you, that you should burst through the hiddenness. Hashem, I'm not giving up on you, no matter what. I'm not giving up. And then the sea splits, and all the problems disappear. Happy Tu B'Shvat. The best lesson of Tu B'Shvat is that we always have to be growing. And we always have to be fruitful. We have to remember our roots. Our roots keep us strong in the big wings. When we grow, it's reflected in the tree trunk. You can measure the rings, right? But the, the, what, what really makes a tree useful and beneficial to mankind is fruit. What's the fruit? The fruit is doing favors. When you do a favor for somebody, when you, have, when you feel for them in your heart, and you sympathize with them, and you help them, that's the fruit. Thank you, Thank you, Chef.